Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you've all had a wonderful day. I think it sounds like and looks like it's been jam-packed, a lot going on, um, and a lot of information for you guys to take in. So I'm here today to talk to you about all things exercise, movement as a way of life, and living with and beyond cancer. So don't look too scared. Somebody just asked me over there, am I okay to have a hot chocolate? You're okay. <laughs> I do eat everything in moderation myself. Um, so hopefully from today's session, I don't have too long with you guys, but hopefully I can share some of my expert knowledge and give you some advice and some tools that you can take away and hopefully provide a little bit of inspiration so you can take some small steps to making some changes that will help your life right now and moving forward, regardless of what's been going on before. So I'm just going to um, share with you this quote that I look at every day of my life, really, and it just it resonated really well with me. So the best project you will ever work on is you. So we have so much going on in our lives, whether it be friends, family, work, stresses, what we think we should be doing, what we think we shouldn't be doing, health, um, disabilities, um, mental health issues. There is so much that is going on. But for me, when I look at this quote, I'm like, we are so important. So just look at you yourself and say, you know, this, the best project I will ever work on is myself. Because in order to live the life that we want to live, we have to look after us. So this is why I'm going to talk to you around today around how movement and exercise and having a healthier and balanced diet can really help increase your quality of life um, and help you both physically and mentally. So I'm just going to share with you, just to give you some context, that you're not somebody on, on st me stood on stage isn't some crazy lady that's just telling you to move more and doesn't really get what you, some of you have been through. So this is me. I was diagnosed with um, Burkitt's lymphoma, so quite a rare form of cancer, six years ago now in 2012 at the age of 24. So I didn't have a clue what cancer was, I didn't have a clue about the side effects, but I found a lump in my neck that developed um, into my abdomen and bowel. I ended up having 13 centimetre tumours in those places. I had nine months of really intense treatment, most of it spent in hospital, and the first eight weeks of my treatment was spent in isolation in hospital. But the journey was really interesting for me. So when I finished my treatment um, eight months later and went into remission, I wanted to walk away from the world of cancer. I didn't want anything to do with it. And I didn't want it to define my life. However, six years on, I'm stood here talking to you today because I learned a lot of powerful things about myself and about the people around me during my journey. And one of them was the, the actual how special moving more and exercise was and the impact it actually had on my life both physically and mentally and basically what happened was I was a runner before so I we work within the work I do now I work with people who've been completely inactive before treatment so I just want to make that clear but my personal journey I was an active young person and I was a runner and that was my sport and when I went through my first round of treatment I said to the doctor the consultant um, who was on the ward rounds at the time, I'm going to go home tomorrow, can I go for a run? And he said, absolutely not. Somebody who's had the same type of cancer as you hasn't ran or hasn't done any exercise a year post chemotherapy. I was like, a year? I was like, I just want to focus on today and what's going on right now. Now I've got to think about what's going to happen in a year or what might not happen. So what did I do? I went and tried to find somebody else who could give me the answer that I wanted to hear. <laughs> So I went to the nurse and I said, can I go for a run? And she said, well, you know, it's not going to harm just to go out for a walk around the block and see what happens. So I went, I put my running gear on because at that time it was the only thing I knew that I was in control of that was normal to me. Everything else, my life was upside down, people were making decisions for me and this was normal to me. So I put my running gear on and I started to walk. And I was like, you know what, I know my body. I've got a bald head at this time, I'd been toxicated with chemotherapy and treatment. But I was like, I know, I feel all right. But let's just take a little bit more of a step. And by the end, I'd done a 30 minute run, six weeks after intense rounds of chemotherapy. But that moment proved to me that my body could be at a point of rock bottom. But if I collaborated myself with my own mind, how powerful that could be to show myself what I could do. So instead of focusing on everything I can't do or what I wanted to achieve, 
All I focused on was putting one foot in front of the other. I didn't think about the outcome. I didn't think about that 30 minute run, but I just put one foot in front of the other and it kind of showed me the impossible. And that's what I want to talk to you today about the small steps that you can make. It's not about, you see people who've gone through treatment that have run marathons and done these crazy things. That is amazing, but that's not for everybody. So every single person in this room has a different, that your own goals, your own needs, your health status is at a completely different point. If you've been diagnosed with cancer, you've had, you're, had different diagnosis. And if you're at the same diagnosis, you've had different experiences and different um, kind of side effects and experiences to treatment. So I want you to all to remember that. It doesn't matter what the person sat next to you has done or is doing. It's all about you. And it's about what tools you can take away from today to help you take the next step. This is, so I just want to tell you about Move Charity, so why I'm stood here today. So with understanding and learning around cancer and exercise, I became a cancer rehab instructor. So I actually went on to set up the charity Move, which in essence provide people with the support that I didn't get. So we are a very small charity, so our online program, which is an online support program by a cancer rehab instructor, which is what I'm qualified in, um, supports children and young people at this stage. If we grow and we can get more money, we can roll it out to everybody. So this we founded with an oncologist consultant in Nottingham, an initiative that is for people living with and beyond cancer, family, friends, health professionals, who also need to spread the word around how movement is important, to come and join us on the last Saturday of every month, link to Park Run, okay? It's about walking, it's about doing it 5K your way. You could do 1K and come back the next month. It's all about how you want to move. But we have founded this and it started off in June last year with one location. We're now at 40 locations around the UK and Ireland. So hopefully every single person in this room by about a year, two years time will have a location and a group near them that they can get involved in. So I'll tell you more about that in, a, in shortly. So before I get into the main part of the presentation, I, what we try and work on is people sitting less and moving a bit more. So that's our main goal, thinking about sitting less and moving more. So I'm going to give you a bit about the big picture. So why has exercise and movement now been associated with people that are living with and beyond cancer? So this is the bigger picture. So some of you will have seen um, things in The Guardian recently around the Australian um, health professionals and experts saying that it's actually more harmful for us not to move when we are going through our treatment or when we are in recovery or if we are living with cancer. Now, that is fair enough, but I, for one, know that there are times where I couldn't get out of bed for like two weeks. So again, it's relative to you and it's moving when you can move um, and focusing on little things to make those steps forward. So there is a now persuasive evidence that healthy lifestyle during and after cancer is associated with improved physical and psychological well-being. The psychological well-being side is as important as the physical. Reduce risks of um, side effects during treatment. Enhance self-esteem. There's been research done around the reduced risks of reoccurrence and improved overall survival. So six years ago, when I was diagnosed with cancer, the reason I set up Move Charity was because there was research, but not a lot of people were talking about it. Now, in 2019, there's a lot of noise around exercise and cancer and the importance of it. And there are things being done to support people, to enable and inspire you to move a little bit more. So that was by the National Cancer Survivorship Initiative. How does that work though? So yeah, okay, exercise and movement's great, but when I'm living with, this is what it feels like when you're living with and beyond cancer. So there might be experiencing cancer-related fatigue, which a lot of us have had to deal with, either having to manage now because we're living with, um, with cancer, or actually we're having to manage even when we stopped our treatment. So the loss of physical strength. So a lot of people are told to sit more, or actually, you, ju you just do that in your day-to-day -day anyway. Depression and anxiety, and also I'm going to add the post-traumatic stress of the cancer journey. I definitely, for one, experience a lot of that because you d no one prepares you for what you're about to go through, and it is a life changer whether you like it or not. So actually, that kind of mental aspect of how you deal with that and how you cope with that, that is a massive burden on your life, which for a long time can go up and down and up and down. Um, so it's about how we manage that. 
weight loss and weight gain. So these issues of getting your body back to what you feel comfortable with. It doesn't matter about anybody else, but where am I at right now with how I feel um, and what, what, yeah, what I want from life? So body image issues, pain is a big one that people are living with, nerve damage, reduced bone by, um, density, swelling, lymphedemia, hot flushes and night sweats. So these are a number of different things that people go through when they're um, living with or beyond cancer. Now the evidence, so this is not limit to, limited to, but it includes, and this is a really long list of what actually exercise can help manage or reduce um, symptoms of. So you've got decreased rate of cancer progression, improved quality of life, the reduced side effects during treatment, um, exercise improves symptoms of cancer-related fatigue, loss of bone mineral density, controls body weight and builds lean muscle, eases symptoms of lymphedemia if that's um, something that you've um, been through, reduces the re incidence of relapse and improves overall survival. But also, most importantly, just because we have had cancer doesn't mean we're not at risk of other comorbidities. So things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, um, um, other types of cancers as well. So actually, it's even more important that we focus on ourselves and living a healthier, more balanced lifestyle to help in those sort of circumstances as well. So what if exercise... Would be, was, would be made into a pill. Every single person in this room would be taking it. However, it is, it, there is processes that you need to put in place in your life to help yourself move a little bit more and focus on what you can do. So it's not as easy as taking a pill, because if it was, we'd all be prescribed it. But it is easy once things become a habit and you'll start missing those things in your life, like moving a little bit more, once you've put them in and they become your day-to-day -day habits. So, for example, it's like in the morning I get up and the first thing I go and do is have a cup of tea. Anyone else with me? Yep. Now, I've done that for probably the last 10 years since I started drinking tea. And it's so foreign for me not to have a cup of tea in the morning that I don't really feel right without it. It is the same when you start to integrate movement in exercise into your life because it's just a habit. We all have habits and things that we do. The reason they've been created, because we've done them enough times that they actually just become part of who we are in our day-to-day -day life. So it's not easy, but there are steps that you can take. So cancer-related fatigue is something that is not just tiredness. But what it is, is I did a conference this morning and we were all saying it's really hard to explain unless you've had it, how it feels. It's not like a nap can make you feel all loads of energy again. If you sleep for an hour during the day, you usually need two hours, three hours. So it's something that we experience, but it's hard to talk about. And it's not just tiredness. But what it's caused by is there's a number of different factors, but it's caused by the cancer itself. It's caused by the treatment, the toxicity of the treatment, and the energy having to go to the right places to help you function. It's also um, caused by hormone changes, and it's also caused by mental anxiety and stress. So why, why, like, what can it actually, the effect it can have on your life? So it can be absolutely devastating. The tasks that you used to think you, you were able to do a lot of, actually it can stop you from doing those. It can stop you from doing your normal routine, going to work, looking after the children, but having time to socialise, being around friends and family. The problem with it is the more you rest, the worse it can get. Um, because it can end up being a really vicious cycle of sleeping more during the day, sleeping at night, and not getting out of that routine. Now, there is a lot of evidence to show that movement during your day, especially getting outside into the fresh air, which also helps mentally in being in that environment, will help to reduce the symptoms of cancer-related fatigue. So we worked, I worked with a young girl who actually used to sleep for three or four hours in the day, sleep for 10, 12 hours at night, um, and really, really struggled, didn't do much movement. And we've helped her get out of that routine. So less sleep, gradually decreasing it, more time moving, and actually her cancer-related fatigue has now decreased. And she is living with cancer. So it can be done, but also on top of that, which I'm going to come on to a bit later, is around the nutrition side of things, that water and hydration is extremely important. So you can't, like me, spend all your day drinking cups of tea, because it's not going to help. I spoke to this young girl and her, she drank 200 to 300 millilitres of water per day. Okay, that is nothing. You need to keep your body hydrated because that also helps with the energy that you need. So exercise can really help that. 
mental health. So this is something that's not talked about enough, but also people just from the outside think cancer is just physical. You have your treatment, you finish, and, or if you're living with cancer, you just have to deal with it. No, you don't, okay? There's a lot of different mental aspects that go on that has impacted you because of having cancer or having friends and family that have had cancer and you having to support them. I have been on like this, an emotional roller coaster since I've had cancer, but I now stand here on stage and say that it's, I wouldn't change it because of what I've actually learned about myself, the people around me, and actually what I'm able to do because of that journey. And I think that's really important that it's about working on that internal dialogue that you're constantly having with yourself, a bit like the little skier. And it's about collaborating with the mind. It's not just about waking up in the morning and going, I'm gonna take on the world, I feel so positive. Okay, it takes time, it takes effort, but actually exercise can really help you do that. So it can give you that mental space that you need away from everything that's going on in your life that you are in control of, and you are in control of the purpose it's, it's having for you. Muscles, so this is, a, this is quite a big area from a physical point of view. So long periods of sitting and um, long periods of not doing very much. If you sit for a long period of time, your muscles will deteriorate. There's no question it, they will deteriorate. So actually, once those muscles deteriorate, you being able to do functional things like going do your shopping, sitting, getting up from the couch or, you know, going out with, with your friends, they become harder and harder and harder. And it doesn't matter if you have a disability or how it works. You, there are still things that you can do to improve that muscular strength and your bone health. So bone health is as important as well. Um, and obviously cancer has a big impact on that, but exercise and doing the right thing can really improve that. So how do you actually get started? So it's all well and good having all this information and I am doing top line level because of the time that we've got. Um, but how do I actually get started? Okay, you said exercise is great for me, so what, what do I do? Well, I like to talk to people about per this perceived barriers and motivators to work it, moving forward because often it's actually our minds that tell us not to do something. And like when I was going through treatment and I went for that run, it's amazing what you can discover when you take that first step. What you thought was potentially impossible now becomes possible. And it's all how your mind thinks about those feelings. So if we look at the barriers, so this would probably resonate with a lot of people in the room, whether you've got one or two points, or actually you look at them all and go, yep, yeah, that's me. So lack of confidence, lack of motivation, embarrassment, like actually, but I can tell you all love doing the cha-cha slide, so we're all right in this room. But, you know, it's going to a gym or, you know, going for a run or going for a walk. Actually, how do you feel about that? What does it make you feel like? So embarrassment is quite a big one. The fear. So I've been through my treatment and what if? What if something happens? Okay, what if this happens to me? And actually, this is one thing I say to everyone. You can always stop. Unless you're literally halfway down a ski run. You can always stop. And if you decide to go for a walk, you can stop, take your breath. Nobody is pushing you to the extent where you shouldn't feel comfortable. And like I said earlier this morning to another group, I might be the expert in cancer and exercise, but you are the experts in your own bodies. You know when things are pain for no reason. You are the experts. So you feel and understand your body and make those decisions. Um, so another barrier is bad weather. Um, dislike of the gym. Okay? Everyone just thinks the only exercise is going to the gym. Actually, most of you to get here will have done some sort of physical activity. So you'd have had to walk from somewhere to get to here. So actually, can exercise be part of your day by moving or going, um, getting the train and t taking a stop a bit further away and walking to, um, to here? So don't think of exercise as just structured exercise. Spontaneous exercise is the best thing you could ever do. And I think it's important to look at it in that way. Um, again, not being the sporty type, living with one or more long-term conditions, lack of time, lack of opportunity, lack of support and unsure where to start. So they are big, motivation, um, big barriers that people may have. However, let's flip it. So what makes us motivated to move? So I was taught quite a long time ago that your why in life is so important. So it doesn't matter necessarily about the what and the how, you'll figure that out. Your why and your motivation to do something is the most important thing you can hold on to. So my why for setting up a charity was because I knew that people weren't getting the support that we should get. 
So that why has stuck with me for so long and motivated me to do what I'm doing today. So in terms of cancer and exercise, motivations can be spending time with family and friends. Increasing your quality of life. So you couldn't get any bigger why than that. Increase and improve, proving that you still can. So we might not be able to do what we want to do, but actually can you prove to yourself that you still can take some small steps and some small changes to make your life be a little bit better? Staying fit and healthy. We need to look after our bodies. We need our bodies. You guys understand that the most. We need them. They need to be there for us. So let's look after them. Let's respect them and don't take them for granted. Personal time. Sometimes being out in the open, just going for a walk is you time. Like focusing on yourself and not letting any other thoughts come into, into, into play. Expanding your social circle. So our 5K Away initiative is amazing for that. So you might meet people from all walks of life who understand what you're going through, but that extend, extends your social circle. Mental health benefits um, decreases social isolation. So when actually, when all the treatment finishes or you're going through your treatment and actually you feel really isolated, where, where does that leave you? So, you know, that could be a really nice motivator. Um, and, and again, improving strength and fitness. I'm only going to touch, this, touch on this quickly, but I... So goal setting is really, really important. I didn't really... Until two, two or three years ago, I thought goal setting, you know, I'm not going to do that. Realistically, I'm going to do that. It's things that I did in school, university, work. Do I ever do it in my personal life? I didn't until I realized how important it was. And the reason it's important is because it makes you accountable for those steps that you want to take. What I say is don't bother setting goals years in advance, okay? Because you're always focusing on the outcome. What we want to do is focus on the process because the outcome may change. And if the outcome changes, that's okay. The reason people fear goal setting is because what happens if I fail? No such thing as failure. Failure for me has been, when I've not achieved something, it's been the biggest life lesson that I could ever have. It shows me what I need to do, what I've learned from it, what I could, like, what I actually need to adapt and change things, because that, that goal wasn't right for me. So people are so scared to take the first step because they're so scared of failing. But failure is just part of life. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing for you to learn and you to discover something about yourself. So goal setting is really important. So I think that any, everybody in this room can do a little bit of goal setting around their exercise and behavior habits. So what I use is I use a simple goal setting um, technique called WHOOP goal setting. So this is something that, a tool that you might be able to take away. So it looks at, so WHOOP is basically what you want to achieve. So do I want to, in two weeks time, be able to walk around the block near where I live? Okay, so that's what I want to achieve. So what does the outcome look like? Now put your head in that moment of when you've walked around the block and you've got home. Yes, you might not enjoy the process of walking around the block, but when you get home, it's like how you felt after the cha-cha slide. I feel good about myself. I've had a laugh, I'm smiling. Actually internally think about how that makes you feel. Because when I feel about things, I get excited, you know, it makes me happy. And I'm not even doing the thing. So just thinking about it can help bring those emotions to the surface to give you a bigger why. And then what we want to look at, like we talked about the barriers, there will be obstacles in place. So time. Do I think I can do it? Do I need somebody to take me out, get me out of the door? And it's like, actually, write them down. Be yourself aware of the obstacles that are in your way. Once you write them down, they feel more real and they feel like you can overcome them even better. So when you write your obstacle down, it could be, so if time's a barrier, it could be, let's schedule it into my diary, okay? I schedule pretty much all my exercise because once you've had about 10 reminders, you have to get out the door. You literally can't turn your back on it because it's telling you to get out that door. Um, and I think, and then the most important thing is create the plan. So. That is whether you're doing that with your family and friends, you're going off and getting expert advice, but you're putting the plan in place before you actually go and do it. And with all of that, it needs to be realistic. So somebody said to me earlier, I'm going to walk seven days a week. And I was like, is that realistic for you? Absolutely not. <laughs> so it's again, is two days more realistic? Is once a week more realistic? Do something that's achievable. And then she also said, well, I'm going to just walk and it doesn't matter what time I'm going to be out there for. I said, why don't you just set yourself a five minute time that I'm going to go for a walk for five minutes. And then if you do anything beyond, that's a bonus. But five minutes was realistic for her. And, it's, and I think that's the same with everyone. Make it time bound and make it realistic. 
And this process will help you become accountable. And also, if you pu put it in your house where you can see it, it will help give you some structure to your life um, that you might need as a nice reminder. I'm massive on spontaneous activity and walking as physical, um, as, so walking and moving as part of your day-to-day -day life. However, if you want to put something more structured in place or think you want to talk to a cancer rehab instructor or go on a programme, these are some of the things that you have to think about. So some of you will want to do, um, go off and do loads of different activities. But for every single person, I always say it's really important to build your foundations. So actually get your body strong enough to then be able to go off and do what you want to do. So this could be chair-based strength exercise, body weight exercises, and actually just focus on the, the frame that supports your skeleton. So things like Pilates are amazing for this because it actually really helps you to just get that strength that you need without a lot of impact and you can understand your body really well. Um, another thing, I'm not massive into like yoga -y type stuff, but I like this woman called Yoga with Adrian. if anyone's has a few nods in the room. Um, and you can do five or ten minutes of light stretching exercises, um, which is really helpful just to follow somebody. The, the exercises aren't going to do you any harm and you can stop if you want to, but that's a nice way to get yourself into something that could be home-based as well. But just to cover those points, the areas that we tend to look at is your cardiovascular fitness, so your heart and lung health. So we need our hearts, don't we? We need them to pump the blood around the body, so we need them to be stronger. So actually, how can we get a little bit out of breath doing some exercise to help build that strength and stamina of the heart muscle? You actually need your muscle strength to stabilise, to support your, um, your structure. Flexibility training, um, especially as you get older, to keep ourselves supple so we can bend down, we can reach up, we can do those sort of movements. And balance and proprioception. So that is something that people underestimate and something think people find difficult. But there are things that you can bring into your programme around that that will really help. This is a really good, it's not, it's not to confuse you, it's just a really good document that Dr Anna Campbell put together and um, a trustee of our charity is part of the um, Sport and Exercise Medicine Centre in Loughborough to just have some things of when not to exercise because people don't have this guidance and then when to be a bit cautious, okay? So I'm not going to go through it, you can all kind of read it, but basically um, like things like infections um, requiring antibiotic therapy, temperature, um, those different elements are when actually to go, right, this is not a good time to exercise, let's go and ask my health professional, go back to the consultant because something is going wrong here and I want to get a second opinion of, of that. So it's really good to have an understanding of this so that you then feel confident to be able to do what you want to do. Again, with the cautions, the cautions doesn't mean you can't exercise, it's just saying, actually, you might just need a bit more specific advice around this first before I go on and do any of those activities that I want to. Um, so I think that's just really important to be aware of. And it's not limited to this, but I think people just sometimes need some nice guidance that they can go through and have as like a benchmark. So these are the top tips that I give everyone. Set goals and build up gradually. Most importantly, find out what works for you. Okay, what makes you happy? What makes you tick? What do you enjoy? Get into a routine. Habits are created when you're in a routine and routine can be really important. However, if you have a chance to do spontaneous activity, take hold of it and grab it because it's, it's amazing. Um, but also make sure you relax and recover. That is so important. We're not telling people to go run marathons or do stupid things. It's all about movement as a way of life and reducing the amount of time you spend sitting. So, but make sure you relax and you recover. You know your body, you know when it needs to rest. So balance the two. Remember, exercise is great for managing cancer-related fatigue. And also, you can get in contact with us if you have any questions. And there's quite a lot of other organisations out there who have provided us the support. So Macmillan are amazing in terms of the information they provide around cancer and exercise. We now have 5K Away Move Against Cancer for Everybody, which is a support group. Um, not as much an advice system, but a support group. Um, but there's also a few of us cancer rehab instructors around there that can give you some support and advice. So, things that you can get involved in. So, this is 5K Away Move Against Cancer. So, it's a community-based initiative to those living with and beyond cancer, family, friends, and those working in cancer services. So, we want health professionals to be practicing what we are preaching around exercise and movement. They need to move as well. Um, you can walk, jog, run, cheer, or volunteer. 
So there's a massive element around the mental benefits of volunteering. But we're also saying you can do 5K your way, so you could do 1K if you wanted to. You could do 500 metres if you want to, and then come and join us at the cafe. So on the last Saturday every month, and we are linked with Park Run. So it's within the Park Run environment. It is a nine o'clock start, but once you've done it, it's done. And it's an absolutely incredible community. So the, this is the information if you want to find out about it. Um, and so movecharity.org, 5kaway.org, and info at 5kaway.org if you want to get involved. I mean, everyone will live in different locations around the country, but look at your local opportunities in terms of cancer-specific classes. Um, or if you can't find a cancer-specific class, it's all about going to instructors and telling them your story and actually explaining the level that they will understand the level that you need to start at. So instead of just rocking up to a class and taking part, actually be mindful that you need to explain what's going on and they will be able to provide more specific to you then. So yeah, you are raising your heart rate slightly, not ridiculous amounts, but you're still working your heart to a, a lighter level. But most importantly, your muscles need to contract to keep you standing. So actually for muscle strength, it is really good to do that. So for example, in my office at work, so I'm home based, I've actually got a standing desk to stop me from sitting as much. Because not only is it sitting can help them, can mean the muscles deteriorate, you tighten up a lot. So if you've got back problems and issues, you know, you feel your hips and your back really suffering from sitting all day. So absolutely standing, just doing the washing up, um, hanging the washing out, um, just either doing it for a bit of work, like a standing desk can really definitely help. So I'm not a dietitian, I'm a cancer rehab instructor. So with, with the diet and the, there's a lot of specific diets around cancer and um, out there at the moment. From the information and the research that I've read, all health professionals, consultants and people working in cancer say that um, as a rule of thumb, a general balanced healthy diet is what you need. There's not enough specific evidence in any direction to say that a specific diet is suited to people living with and beyond cancer. So a healthy balanced diet is what is generally recommended by health professionals.